I'd like to welcome you to our uh, fourth uh, of the Friday Forum series. Um, we're delighted that you've uh, chosen to join us this morning. I I'm Keith Brandt. I'm the Vice Chancellor for University Relations, and it's a, a pleasure to have you here. Um, the theme for today is all about community, um, and you'll see that woven through what we're doing. And um, I'm, I'm going to just make a few remarks and in introduce our speakers. But um, so uh, community manifests itself in so many different ways. Uh, today actually is the start of our alumni weekend, where we're bringing back um, some members of our community who haven't been to campus in a while, and uh, and and show them a good time. And there's lots of events on campus. And if you're interested in participating, there's there's plenty of room for you to do so. Um, you may have read recently that the university is launching its um, another round of its long-range uh, development planning, and that's so uh, we see that as a three-year process. And one of the things we want to do differently this time than we did last time is really engage the community from the beginning and have a dialogue throughout it. It's it's it can be a controversial process because it hits all of our hot buttons: um, housing and and traffic and transportation and water and and growth, and uh, we, we don't want to do this in isolation. Um, it's very much like a city's general plan, and it, it, it outlines you know, a plan for the future, but it's, it's, we do know we want to engage the community, and, and, and we're very much committed to doing so. Um, speaking of community, uh, you may have participated or seen last weekend that um, uh, millions of people around the country walked for um, the, in the sake of science. And uh, here in Santa Cruz, thousands of, of people, community members, marched for science. And that was wonderful to see the support. Um, you see Santa Cruz is, um, science is, is, is part of what we do. In fact, if you, if you look at the, the, the budget for the campus, you could pretty much say in generalities that the state and the students pay for the cost of education, and the federal government is funding the cost of, of research. In fact, we get last year we got about $106 million from the federal government and federal agencies for research, and, and science research is especially um, threatened these days if you look at the president's proposed budget. And um, there are ways you can help us um, and actually help our society because science impacts all of us by being an advocate for science um, with the federal government and with it, uh, legislators. Uh, and uh, I, I, we can help show you ways that you can, you can help us with, um, with that. Um, another way community uh, is in a, comes into impact today is that we have a member of the Community Foundation here, which is nice this morning. Uh, we just recently got a grant uh, for $450,000 from the Community Foundation Fund for Women and Girls at um, and it really, it's a, it's a program to uh, help about 35 middle school girls from the Pajaro Valley participate in a three-year program that we help facilitate on campus. And, you know, the tragedy is from when a girl is in sixth grade, um, girls in sixth grade are 60, 80 percent interested in science and math. By the time they get to eighth grade, that percentage drops into the single digits. So it's, our, it's it, that period of time of keeping girls interested in, in math and science is absolutely critical, and this grant is really working towards that program. So it's very exciting, and we're, we're very happy to be partnering with the Community Foundation um, in that way. So uh, just uh, a few notes about our, um, our local community. You may have read about uh, Harry Noller, who is our longtime uh, a uh, faculty member who recently won the Breakthrough Prize, which is a $3 million prize from um, a group of um, Silicon Valley investors, and he runs the DNA Center, and we're just excited to have a, a Breakthrough Prize winner on campus. Um, you may have seen that uh, last week, uh, Time Magazine named uh, its uh, 100 Most Influential People, and two of them were UC Santa Cruz alumni. One is Natalie Battaglia, who is, was central to NASA's flight mission to discover Earth-like planets, the Kepler mission. And the other one is uh, Carmen Perez, who is uh, one of the four chairs of the Women's March that took place in, in January. And she's actually going to be here tonight um, as one of our Alumni Weekend speakers. She's speaking at the Coconut Grove at 7. And uh, there are tickets still available, and you're more than ha welcome to join us. But um, we expect a good showing for that. And then um, we also uh, lost two members of our community recently. One is, for those of you who've been in the community a long time, um, Bob Sinsheimer, who was the chancellor for 11 years in the, um, what, the, 80, the late 70s and, and 80s. Um, Bob was really instrumental uh, in, in the campus in many ways, but especially 
um, known for getting the genomics project started and, and having an, an impact in, really in the world in terms of his work in genomics. Um, he also probably indirectly is responsible for the banana slug. <laughs> that was the time of the fight on campus between what the mascot would be, and he came out very much opposed to the banana slug, and that just, you know, with our students, that will just do you in. <laughs> um, the other person we lost recently is a longtime Santa Cruz community member, uh, Harry Husky, who uh, was a, a computer scientist and very much uh, influenced us so much in, in the, the early days of, of computer science. So our, our two speakers today are, are also talking about um, aspects of the community. Um, and, uh, and they're coming from environmental studies, which is part of our social science division on campus. I actually want to give a shout out to show social sciences because um, I recently participated on the Dean Search and, it, and just learned a ton about social sciences. And it's an amazing and perhaps the m most underappreciated uh, division of the university. And the, the thing that happened just uh, recently is um, we've had two, in, two Carnegie Fellows two years in a row in our politics department. And I don't know if you know about the Carnegie Fellows, but they're the, um, it's probably the premier fellowship for social science and humanities in the country. There's only 30, about 35 selected every year. And we had one last year, uh, Mark Massoud, who is associate professor of politics. And this year, um, Sinkina Janae, uh, Associate Professor of Politics was just named last week as a Carnegie Fellow. So two Santa Cruz in a row for our politics department is just amazing. Um, so I'm, uh, we're super proud of what's going on in, in, in our uh, social sciences. So today um, we want you to hear about community perspectives from two, community relationships from two different perspectives. First up, I'm going to introduce both of them and they'll both come up and then we'll save time at the end uh, for Q&A and, uh, and our promise is to get you out of here by 930. So that's, a, that's, that's the program. And then our second speaker is Chris Benner, who is also a professor of environmental studies. And is, in both his work as director of the Everett program and through his research, he examines the relationships between technology, regional development, and economic opportunity. Uh, today, we'll, Chris will talk about the Monterey Bay. But with the support of a recent grant he received from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, he will expand his inclusive economies research to Brazil, India, and South Africa. So it should be fascinating. Wow, that's a really tough act to follow. That was so inspiring, Flora. Thank you. I, you know, I've known about the ASB, but never actually seen you present about it. So it's super exciting. Um, I'm going to present a little bit of research that hopefully will give you some ideas and thoughts about things that we can do in the Monterey Bay that's focused on the relationship between uh, social equity, economic growth, uh, and communities, and particularly um, knowledge communities, uh, looking across the, the U.S. Before getting into some of the specifics of that research, though, I wanted to give you a sense of some of what motivates uh, the work behind this. This is work that's done with uh, a collaborator, uh, Manuel Pastor, who's a UC Santa Cruz graduate, a former professor in Latino and Latin American studies. He's now gone off to the University of Stolen Colleagues, uh, USC. <laughs> <laughs> You knew that was coming, right? <laughs> anyway, part of what motivates this work is a sense that nationally we really are in a state of uh, at least challenges, if not serious, crisis. Um, and there's at least three dimensions to that crisis that are really important. Um, one is a jobs crisis that's linked with stagnant wages and slow job growth, not just since the last Great Recession, but at least over the last uh, three decades of economic recycling of uh, jobless growth and slow growth overall, um, an inequality crisis with uh, unprecedented levels of inequality. That chart shows the percentage of total income captured by the top 10% of income earners going back to the early 1900s up to the current period. And the last time we had, let's see, how does this, the last time we had that level of inequality was back in the Great Depression in the 1930s. Um, and that's where we are today. I could actually bore you for hours just with statistics about the economic crisis and inequality. I, I could actually bore you for a whole quarter around those statistics, because I know, because I bore my students with that, but you know, they pay for the privilege, so we'll have to skip that this morning. Um, but the other dimension of the crisis is, of course, a, a political crisis. And we see that every day in terms of the levels of partisanship and gridlock in, um, in Washington. 
uh, that's driven in part by a sense of both uh, economic insecurity and insecurity about sort of the demographic changes and other globalization associated links in our country overall, but I think is underpinned by a series of fragmentations that we're experiencing in society uh, in sort of spatial isolation that's occurring. We know about high levels of racial segregation. One of the things that's happening also, though, is high levels of um, spatial sorting by ideology, by partisanship. Um, those uh, counties there show those counties where in 1992, uh, either the Republican or the Democratic presidential candidate won by a landslide in that county. It was about 25% of the population in 1992. That's the most recent election. It's about 57% of the population lives in a place where everyone thinks like themselves in one way or another, at least that you meet on a, on a regular basis. Um, and part of what's also experienced, and I think is a, a crisis in many of the institutions that we depend on as a society. Um, Congress has had a long-term decline in uh, people's confidence in them doing their job. Uh, my favorite indicator of that was a survey that was done a couple years ago um, when we faced another fiscal cliff and crisis of shutting the government down, which is happening today, perhaps. Um, but the survey was asking people to compare Congress with a number of other unpleasant things. So outpolling Congress included things like uh, lice, uh, colonoscopy, people actually prefer a root canal to thinking about Congress. Uh, actually, the only thing that Congress outpolled was uh, telemarketers and schoolyard bullies. So we have a crisis. I mean, that's the body of Congress that's supposed to be, uh, you know, federal government closest to the people. But another dimension of our crisis has to do with the nature of our, our national politicians. And um, one of the best indicators I, I have of this, uh, or my favorite one, is uh, PolitiFacts tried to review the statements that candidates make, a whole range of candidates going back to the 1990s, uh, and the extent to which they can be considered um, true, is in blue, uh, mostly true, uh, half true, half false, mostly false, false, or pants on fire false. Um, and Trump is, of course, in the largest category there of pants on fire false, about 25% of his statements. Um, best categories include both Republicans and Democrats, actually Obama, Clinton, but also Bush, Kasich as well. But what's most disturbing about this to me is that even the best candidates, only about half of their statements can be considered true or mostly true in a public context. And when you have that pattern across the board, it's not an individual pathology. It has to do with the nature of our electoral system and our media system. Uh, in which people feel they have to do sound bites or other kind of things appealing to emotions that aren't rooted in knowledge and facts. And of course, people know we live in a period where facts seem to matter less in political life, and we live in our filter bubble, social media-driven uh, news world where we have alternative facts and different understandings of what's going on in our society. So uh, an economic crisis, ine inequality crisis, and really a level of fragmentation that's rooted in different understandings of what's going on in our country. So that's the inspiring part of the talk. It's downhill from here. <laughs> no, so we think that answers to these kind of problems lie in the experiences of a number of regions around the country that have been successful over the last 30 years of this economic restructuring of creating not just growth, but in creating just growth. So social justice and economic growth going together. And let me tell you a few of those stories. Um, sorry, uh, before getting into the stories, let me tell you a little bit about how we identified those regions. Because one of the things you find as a, as a professor when you write your research grants is that you often write them to go to the places you'd like to go visit. That's why we have so much written about Portland and Seattle. And, <laughs> But uh, when you let the numbers drive places that are successful in linking growth and equity, it takes you to some really unusual places. So this is a map. What we did is put together indicators of growth and equity over 30 years, created an index of both. And those places that are in green or light green are the more successful places. And some of the red places we went to, too, to try and understand some of the different uh, patterns. 
Uh, we did a bunch of quantitative analysis of sort of comparing these outcomes of growth and equity with a whole series of um, kind of dimensions of the region, industry, politics, et cetera. And um, this is another thing that I should warn you about. I have training as an economist, and you know the kind of person who becomes an economist is someone who's very good at math and likes numbers, but doesn't have an entertaining enough personality to become an accountant. So um, get ready for a bunch of tables with regression equations. No, I won't do that to you. But uh, I wanted to show you one uh, indicator that's really interesting. We tried to replicate some research that uh, had been done at an international scale by the International Monetary Fund, looking at what predicts at a country level um, the ability to sustain growth. So this is really the ability to avoid a recession. And we know from all sorts of research that it's not just the pace of economic growth that's important, but if you can avoid the ups and downs of the economic cycle, it makes a tremendous difference in people's lives uh, and the economy overall. Uh, and it turns out that our results parallel almost exactly the international uh, research, which is that the level of income inequality in a region is the best predictor of a region hitting a recession sooner. So the more unequal you are, the more likely you're have, gonna have uh, economics ups and downs. A few other important predictors are important. One has to do with the level of fragmentation and decision-making structure in the region. Those regions that are more fragmented, more likely to hit a recession. We looked also at uh, political dimensions in a region and trying to see, well, is it predominantly Republican or predominantly Democrat that makes a difference? There's actually no association whatsoever. There's a slight association with the level of political homogeneity of the region as a whole. If you have a similar ideology in the region as a whole, you're a little less likely to hit a recession. But the most critical factor on that political dimension is um, the level of difference, spatial sorting between the central county and the suburban areas of the region. The greater disparity there is in those political views, the more likely to hit a recession. So all of these are pointers, again, to as a region, the more fragmented you are, the worse economic experience you have. And I should say regions, maybe it's obvious, are really important economic units. People commute, labor patterns, all sorts of kind of clustered relationships are happen at a regional scale. But let me tell you a little bit more about some of the stories of successful places. Um, Jacksonville, Florida is not on the tourist path of academic researchers, so there's very little written about it, but it turns out to be a very successful place. Now in the 1960s, uh, they had civil rights activists, similar to those in Greensboro that were trying to integrate the lunch counters of the local um, Walgreens. Uh, they have levels of racial inequality and conflict that are at least as bad uh, that we have today in the country as a whole. And this is what uh, political dialogue looks like in the 1960s in Jacksonville. This was a very famous day that came to be known as Axe Handle Saturday when white segregationists organized to counter a civil rights demonstration, handing out axe handles so people could use that to beat up the protesters. Uh, the police were warned ahead of time that this was gonna happen. They refused to become involved until the civil rights activists uh, started grabbing the axe handles and defending themselves, then they intervened. Uh, something like 60 people ended up in the hospital that day. The mayor at the time, who was an avowed segregationist, uh, went on national media and praised the police for their actions, essentially lying. So you can see it's the same set of challenges and issues that we have today as a country. So what happened in Jacksonville after that experience? Well, one of the things they did was to get rid of local government of the city government. Well, actually what they did is combine the city center, which is right there, with the surrounding county to create a single city, which is still the largest in the lower 48 by land area. Now, why is that important? Well, if you think of a typical fragmented region, you could think Detroit or Gary, Indiana, you have a process of um, jobs fleeing to the suburb, white flight, good schools, good tax base in the suburbs, it's a virtuous cycle, and in the central city, declining infrastructure, declining population, higher costs of maintaining, it's a real vicious cycle going on. But in Jacksonville, it's all one city, and it's all one tax base with the ability to um, cross-subsidize and regenerate those resources across the city. 
But even more important, we think, is the work of a small nonprofit called the Jacksonville Community Council. Since the early 1970s, they've done two critical things. One is to publish an annual indicator report about key things going on in the region. So knowledge, facts actually matter. It's become an important uh, touch point for leaders throughout the region around economic change, social change, fiscal health of the city, a whole variety of social issues. But they've also perfected a process that they call the community council. And what this does is get groups about this large, about 20 to 25 people, coming from as diverse a range of perspectives and life experiences they can get in the room together to commit to a nine-month process of coming together one night a week for three hours to investigate a single issue or problem in the region. Could be challenges of race relations. It could be how do we grow green jobs. It could be how do we deal with high levels of teenage pregnancy. There's a whole range of issues that they've done over the years. They meet with stakeholders, they meet with researchers, they discuss their own perspectives and interests in this, and at the end of that process, come up with a set of recommendations about what the region can do about it. And here's what's critical. The recommendations are arrived at not by our typical political process of let's get 50% of the people to agree with me. No, it's coming about by a process of sufficient consensus. So people are hearing everyone's viewpoints, figuring out how do you incorporate that into the recommendations and coming up with a, a unified statement that at least represents everyone's point of view to the point where they don't block it. So what's been the result? Well, Jacksonville has grown twice as fast as the average metropolitan region in the South uh, since 1980 and has reduced indicators of social inequality at a time when most regions have become more unequal. Salt Lake City is another interesting place I would not have predicted going. Turns out to be one of the most equitable regions in the country. And I imagine what you're all thinking is, well, okay, it's easy to do that in a place that's homogenous, it's white, you know, similar Mormon ideology. In fact, that's an old view of what Salt Lake City was in the 1980s. It is going through a demographic change now that's more rapid than the country as a whole and will become majority-minority region probably five years before the country as a whole. And it has been remarkably open to immigrants uh, and people of color. So a couple of indicators of that, you know, in California, undocumented immigrants got the right to a driver's license two years ago. In Utah, it was 1999. Uh, dreamers, uh, students who are undocumented, came to this country, you know, through their parents. Uh, had right to pay in-state tuition in Utah colleges by 2002. Uh, in the late 2000s, there was a whole group of leaders who led what was called the Utah Compact, which was trying to create a set of principles about how do we talk about immigration and the role of immigrants in our community, whether documented or not, and came up with a set of principles that include things like the importance of keeping families together, not deporting undocumented parents from um, kids who are here um, legally, uh, recognizing the contributions of all immigrants, whether documented or not, to our economy and the importance of valuing that. Uh, and so you can see there was an openness to immigrants that's quite remarkable. Well, how is that the case in Salt Lake City? Well, again, two key sets of issues. One has to do with a couple of features of the Mormon church. About 50% of people living in the Salt Lake City metro are Mormon. Uh, the Mormon Church has a very strong program of international work for young people. Uh, large numbers of people, you know, 18 to 24, go overseas for two to three years. Some of it's evangelical work, but a lot of it is social service work. They're learning other languages, having the experiences of being abroad. Actually, the majority of Mormons now in the world are outside of the United States with large groupings in uh, Mexico and Peru. So when they come back home, then they have an openness and awareness of the experience of being the other in a society and an openness to immigrants. The church also has a lay clergy structure. And what that means at the local unit of the church, the local bishop is uh, a, a temporary, it's a lay, he's there for three to six years. It's always men at the moment, although there's a movement to get women in that as well. One of the things that they're responsible for is administering a provident fund for the poor. Mormons are expected to fast one day a month and give that funds to a, a fund for the poor. 
And that work involves not just a handout, but very much a hand up, working very closely with poor communities and poor individuals, not just Mormons, but anyone in the local area to get them connected to social service resources and communities that can help them out. So where else in the country do we have a systematic process where what are predominantly business leaders, political leaders, predominant men in the community have to spend three to six years in which they're working very actively as a social worker with poor communities and bridging those ties. Another key organization is, again, a small nonprofit in Vision Utah that uh, has led a process of long-term visioning for the region. It's the kind of thing, you know, the Association of Bay Area Governments or the Monterey Bay Association of Governments does to look at transportation planning long-term and what that does that mean if we look at the predictions of population growth and job growth and housing growth, where do they go? But what's interesting in the Envision Utah case, in part because it's a flexible small nonprofit, is that they integrated that with a whole series of discussions about our environmental future, the quality of air, around health care, around quality of life and access, as well as around jobs and work and where do we want to live in the long term, and involved literally over 50,000 people through a combination of in-person and online interactions around different scenarios of development and how do we want to live in the long term. And what was critical people told us about this is that you start seeing a common future together for people who may have very different priorities in the short term. There was a very you know, clear example they gave us of a, um, a conflict over a major uh, freeway and throughway going through the area where a lot of the economic development interests were in favor of it, a lot of the environmental interests were opposed to it. And if you've got a plan that's going in in the next year or two, uh, you have lots of conflict. But if you're looking at how do we want to grow 5, 10, 20 years down the road, there's a lot of common interests in people wanting to have jobs close to housing, wanting to have decent transportation and um, quality of life, and that helped overcome a lot of those conflicts. And Salt Lake City now has, by some metrics, the very best uh, mass transit system in the country. And um, if I had more time, I'd show you some of the interesting uh, ads that were in support of that that helped link sort of car drivers and metro drivers and sort of linking poor and rich communities through this transportation system. Let me tell you one more case study of places that I didn't expect to go, which was Oklahoma City. Now, this is a very conservative place where people were very proud to say in the whole state of Oklahoma, not a single county voted in favor of uh, President Obama in either 2008 or 2012. And yet they turned the city around from a period in the 1980s of economic stagnation and tremendous um, inequality through increased taxes that was advocated for by a Republican Chamber of Commerce and four different Republican mayors who were able to convince a majority of the electorate to vote for more taxes, not just not once, not just twice, but three different times. Now, how did they do that? Well, one of the things is kind of similar to Jacksonville. Um, Oklahoma City uh, is a very large land area and a very large economy within city boundaries. In 1950, Oklahoma City was that little black area in the middle. It's about 50 square miles. In 15 years, it had become 650 square miles through a process of annexation. And so when you have an additional, you know, one cent sales tax on an economy that large, you have resources that you can really do something with. And so the first project uh, included nine different proposals. It included developing the basketball arena, uh, which became the home of the Oklahoma City Thunder, which they stole from Seattle, for any of you basketball fans up there. Um, it was an opera house. It was uh, uh, improvements in the county fairgrounds. Uh, they redeveloped the river. They jokingly called the river that goes through Oklahoma City the river you have to mow because it was so overgrown. Uh, and they've turned it into a series of river lakes that's now become a wonderful location for active outdoor life. It's also become a training ground for Olympic crew across the, the country and also um, kayaking. Uh, subsequent investments were for uh, education infrastructure and more quality of life initiatives. What was critical in this case is that they knew what they were voting for, the, um, the voters, 
The people advocating for it help people see connections between their own interests and other interests. So are you going to give up the basketball arena just because you don't like opera? Are you going to give up the minor league baseball stadium because, you know, you don't like a uh, crew? Um, but also helping people see intergenerational solidarity. So, you know, you'd go to the suburban areas and say, well, okay, well, much of this is invested in downtown. We know you're happy out in the suburbs. You may not want to live downtown, but we're building the city your children want to live in. And so rather than going off to that horrible place, California, they can actually stay in Oklahoma City. So Seattle's another very interesting case that's a lot more traditional of a progressive place pulling people together around a common set of visions. But you know, what does all this mean? And you know, if you know anything about academics, you know that when we have a research project, um, there's two things we have to do. We have to say, one, that we've discovered something brand new. Uh, it's better if we give it a scholarly sounding name. Uh, but the second thing we have to say is like, well, we don't fully understand it yet, so we're going to need a little more research <laughs> funds to you know, investigate it a little more. So um, what we think we're discovering in these region, regions are knowledge communities. Epistemic just means knowledge, the nature of knowledge, uh, in which there's shared knowledge and agenda um, built on a regional scale in ways that are particularly diverse and dynamic in terms of both the people represented in those knowledge communities and the kind of issues they're being addressed uh, and the kind of action and responses that, that come from that. Again, I could bore you for days with the literature behind this, but there's three things that you can really remember about this point that's critical, which is what we call the three R's. So one is the importance of long-term roots in the region. In all these successful cases, there's a sense of a long-term destiny together, and how do we build that destiny despite our differences? So it's not about defeating someone because we don't want to deal with them. It's about how do we um, address a common future together across those differences, which requires relationships repeated interactions uh, in which you're dealing with the differences and understanding people's different values in a way that doesn't demonize the opponent, recognizes the challenges of coming to a commonality um, through a process of building relationships in which reason rather than ideology and facts and information drive that process. So let me just finish with sort of a few thoughts about what that means for building a diverse epistemic community in the Monterey Bay with some of our contrast that Flora's presentation so clearly highlighted between sort of our coastal areas in Monterey and Santa Cruz and our inland areas so rooted in agriculture. Um, one way to think about this, I've done some work in developing something called a regional opportunity index that's housed at the University of California Davis Center for Regional Change. It integrates indicators across six different categories of education, the economy, housing, transportation, uh, mobility in the environment, and civic engagement. And you can see in the Monterey Bay, we have this tremendous contrast between kind of our Peninsula, Monterey Peninsula and Santa Cruz, where green is good, all systems go, and our interior area, eastern part of the county, which is predominantly red, high levels of warning. And when you look at the different populations in those two parts of our region, in the uh, western part of the region, a uh, smaller population, actually about two-thirds of the total population in the region are in the eastern part of the county. In the western part, predominantly non-Hispanic white, about 70%. In the interior, predominantly Latino, about 64%. So tremendous racial contrast. And part of that is the result, of course, of the demographic transition that California is really leading the country as a whole. And so what that means is you have an older population that is predominantly white and a younger population of people in our school system and coming into a college that are vastly uh, predominantly uh, people of color and predominantly Latino in particular. This is one way of measuring that. It's sort of the gap between the percentage of population that are non-Hispanic white um, for under 18 or 65 and older. That's a 44% gap, which is one of the highest of any regions in the country, in our region. Now, why is that important? Well, because the people who are somewhat older, tend to have more influence in the region, more decision makers, making decisions about tax allocation and spending. Younger people is where our future lies in the future of the region. This is a chart that shows at a state level on the bottom axis that uh, 
racial generation gap. Now remember, we're as a region out here at 44%. This ends at 40, so it's pretty far. And the y-axis is an uh, income-adjusted measure of spending on public education. And it shows where that racial generation gap is higher, less spending on the young people. Right? And whereas California in that process, well, we're about right there. So um, that's one of our challenges in a region, is building the investment in education. I want to run through quickly in like three minutes, so we have some time for question and answers. Just what are some of the issues in our region that emerge from this regional opportunity index that might provide a commonality uh, of issues that could connect our Salinas and Watsonville with Monterey and Santa Cruz? Um, education is one of the critical ones, and one of the issues there has to do, these are just a set of indicators, again, for the east side of the county and the west side of the county, um, that shows some of the contrast, but one of the common areas is this issue of what we call teacher experience. It's the percentage of teachers that are in elementary schools who've been there at least five years and have some additional training. It's an indirect indicator, but not bad. So the reasons for this low level of highly qualified teachers in that area, it may be different, right? These are challenging schools in Salinas and Watsonville. In Monterey and Santa Cruz, the cost of living makes it very hard to survive in these places on a teacher's salary, but it's a common issue across the region. Um, in the economy, tremendous challenges in Watsonville and Salinas across all dimensions, but even in our uh, peninsula areas, the quality of jobs um, and job growth uh, is lagging way behind. So the need to increase the job quality and create more high paying jobs across the region is really important. Housing, of course, is a challenge across the region. But again, for somewhat different reasons. Of course, we have tremendous affordability challenges in Santa Cruz and, and Monterey. But actually, when you look at housing adequacy, which is a measure of the number of housing units per population, because we have so many vacation homes and second homes in the area, there's actually a whole pool of underutilized homes in that area. So there's lots of adequacy. In Watsonville and Salinas, high levels of overcrowding and about average levels of affordability uh, compared to California average, which is, of course, very difficult. And finally, just in terms of looking at our civic life, turns out there's pretty high voting rates compared to California average throughout the region. So people are engaged, but somewhat different populations. Uh, again, in the interior, we have low levels of um, people who are U.S. citizenship. So um, about 37% of the population in Watsonville and Salinas are immigrants, foreign born. About half of those in each place um, are not yet citizens or not citizens. 70 to 75% of households in Watsonville and Salinas speak a language other than English at home. Mostly Spanish, of course. Um, but very strong neighborhood stability and rooted communities. California actually has the highest level of any state in the country of long-term immigrants. Many of the immigrants in Watsonville and Salinas have been there 10 years or longer, so deeply rooted sense of civic life and culture in that area. And of course, in uh, Santa Cruz and Monterey, we have high levels of uh, instability in our neighborhoods, right? Students voting and leaving and a uh, very transient uh, workforce to a certain extent as well. So um, something to build on, but real challenges in civic life across the region. So final thought, um, you know, in this country, we tend to um, uh, talk about action more than words because um, we care a lot more about actions and, you know, sort of think that talk is cheap. Um, but in fact, um, the final kind of word in our book is that talk is not actually cheap. It requires effort and engagement, and it can be really critical for changing hearts and minds in ways that encourages kind of a collaboration rather than the sort of zero-sum competition that seems to dominate so much of our political dialogue today. So thanks for your attention. If you're interested in more information, there's a couple of web links for you. About uh, 10 minutes left for questions for either Chris or Flora. Well, in the interest of putting something on the floor, um, Chris, I've, I've uh, heard you do this once before, and it's, it's mesmerizing. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about the geographic area and the notion that one succeeds more by having a larger geographic area being the decision making group, 
what do you think would be our optimal decision making area and and do you foresee a path that might get us to that yeah i mean i think the issue is not so much the size of the economic area cuz you know successful regions have been you know small and large regions as well and in fact there's no relationship between kind of the population of the region and being a just growth region what's critical is the integration of it now, our challenge as Santa Cruz in particular is that we have a set of ties with, you know, South County and the rest of the Monterey Bay, and we have a set of ties with Silicon Valley, both of which really drive a lot of the dynamics in the city of Santa Cruz itself in somewhat different ways. And so we have to figure out sort of how to integrate uh, with decision makers and populations across both that area. So I think that's a particular challenge we mm -hmm. face, not unique in the country, because there's lots of uh, kind of sub-regions within broader mega-regions, but I, I think that's one of the critical challenges. And, you know, again, part of that is how do you build those relationships with city governments, with businesses, with community organizations, mm -hmm. and really sort of build those cross-race, cross-place uh, connections um, that are hard. But I think, again, it's not so much the size as it is the nature of those relationships and integration. Mm -hmm. And this speaks to efforts such as the Digital Nest, for instance, in, in Watsonville and Salinas now, mm -hmm. and this really great, I'm sure all of you, you know, in this room sort of know about this, and Jacob Martinez and his effort to, um, to address the digital divide among you know, low-income, mostly you know, um, Chicano Latino youth in these um, in sort of the more inland areas by giving them that technological um, and sort of like tech support and education, which um, is so important because it really does articulate with the Everett program and what you all do there. Um, yeah, I think, and they've gotten some great funding from Silicon Valley because they do see that as the future. I wanted to ask you at Calabasas School. Uh -huh. um, UCSC has a very vigorous life lab program. Yes. Is that what you're no, actually, we're not. We are. Um, we're drawing. We're being informed by some of that really wonderful curricula that they have over at Life Lab. But really, um, you know, we see our efforts around issues of food justice and, and food sovereignty as really complementary to what CASVIS has done for the past 40 years. And, and I think in part because we really wanted to be a grassroots-based, um, student-led, really student-engaged effort. And, and you know, CASVIS has, they have very, very deep roots. And they're really built out of, I think, what's, um, it, was, it was innovative in many ways, but also really leadership that has come, that's been mostly, um, you know, very, like, you know, elite and privileged and certain, like, sort of visions about, you know, like, what agriculture can look like. And their focus is really on the apprentice program, and our focus is really on empowering, I think, low-income students of color, people of color. And so while we, we articulate with them and we've had conversations and it's been productive, we see our, our vision and sort of our approach as being slightly different. And this comes out for me for many years of being an environmental justice organizer and being engaged in that movement and that body of scholarship. And um, and so I, oftentimes people to say, oh, we are working with, you know, Life Lab and, you know, CASVIS and so forth. And, and, you know, of course, our colleague, Daniel Press, is the director of CASVIS. So we get to see him all the time mm -hmm. and we are in conversations with him. But I think that our approach in the colleges is different because, you know, when we engage with groups like Calabasas, with, you know, with Ann Lopez and CFF and so forth, we do that from this perspective of um, having a heightened awareness of issues of race and class, difference in power. And if I had to, you know, encourage CASVIS in terms of like how they, I th think they can grow in the future, is precisely to sort of expand their their expertise in that. And I know that's something that they want to do, um, but that is certainly, um, you know, we sort of have different sort of stories of origins and different ways of working. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, it sort of jumped out at me when you when you talked about Jacksonville because I have a friend just uh, visited Jacksonville recently, and um, she was kind of dismayed that people would want to live there at all. I mean, I, I mean it, it, it's not fair to say that, but I mean, she was like, it's strip mall after strip mall. There's nothing there. It's like, I mean, she was there for visiting her friends, so forth and so on. And uh, I think the thing that's interesting about Santa Cruz is, of course, it's incredibly. Um, um, popular as a place to, to live. And um, we, when we talk about the one law that we can never repeal, it's called the law of supply and demand. And Santa Cruz faces a special challenge because, um, you know, especially as our baby boomer people want to, to uh, retire to a, you know, a predominantly, you know, safe, which is coded for white, area, Santa Cruz, you know, the, the, that drives a lot of our economy. 
And so I'm wondering, I, I love equality. I mean, I, I think you're right on in terms of looking at that as a, as a predictor of a lot of things. And I just wonder what your thoughts are in terms of, well, how do you, uh, how do you equalize how do you fight the law of supply and demand in this situation? Because this is really the elephant in the room, I think. Yeah, so that's such a big question. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of the economics uh, profession, you know, one of the challenges, I think, is that um, we have a lot of silos in our society around um, jobs uh, and businesses and around housing and around transportation. And decisions about all three of those tend to happen, um, you know, at best informed by what's happening in the other areas, often without serious consideration of that, and almost never in concert. So, for instance, you know, I've just been recently involved in um, Facebook's effort to expand their campus um, in uh, Menlo Park, and uh, you know, they can go ahead and build offices that are going to house like 4,000 people without necessarily having to commit to housing construction as part of that. Mm -hmm. Now, through a lot of political pressure and support, they ended up putting something like $25 million into new housing construction. But we should have a process by which, if you're going to plan for economic growth and job growth, that has to be linked with where is housing going to be built at all levels of workforce income? And so part of that means creating permanently affordable housing units close to where people work who are working in those positions. Um, and of course, linked to an improved uh, transportation system that's not dependent so much on the automobile, but has much more you know, bus, light rail um, you know, types of, and bus rapid transit is another critical issue. Because of course, the key challenge of having bus transit is it's stuck in the same traffic as cars are. But there's all sorts of lessons from around the world and other parts of the US where you can create de dedicated lanes for buses, and so you can be a much quicker commute path um, and provide incentives for that. So I think that's one issue that's part of that. You know, I think some of the racial dimensions of, you know, those of us who have a place to live in Santa Cruz now are some of the strongest defenders of, like, we can build no more. You know, the door's got to shut. We can't increase the number of students in Santa Cruz. We can't allow other people in. Um, and I think that has tremendous racial dynamics to it that we really have to overcome and kind of make those connections. But ultimately, in terms of some of the biggest challenges of that, which is our housing affordability issue, we need all sorts of new models of large-scale development of, of affordable housing. And I have all sorts of ideas about how we can do that, but um, it would be a longer conversation. So we can talk a little bit afterwards if you're interested. <laughs>